Hi, folks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm pretty excited because I'm going to be interviewing Chris Jankolowski. I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. He recently wrote a book called Near Death Lessons, and I wanted to just give you a quick summary of Chris and what he's been through uh, prior to our conversation. At 19 years old, Chris was diagnosed with von Hippel Lindau, which is also known as VHL syndrome, and for a time uh, allowed this diagnosis to get the better of him. However, a series of near-death experiences triggered a profound positive personal transformation, which eventually led Chris to live the life of his, his dreams. Everyone faces adversity in life. It's simply a part of the human experience. But what separates the people who persist, survive, and even thrive through challenges from others whose obstacles stop them in their tracks. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing that, what distinguishes those types of people. So a little bit about Chris. He is the founder and CEO of Remote Staff, which is a recruiting company specializing in remote working placements. Remarkably, he was able to build, grow, and thrive his business while he was battling cancer, failing kidneys, and several brain operations throughout these challenges and more, Chris was able to find a way to perform his life from one of fear, struggle, and self-doubt to one of empowerment, success, health, and happiness. And today, I'm so excited to be able to share his advice to us all about how he dealt with these struggles, and I'm so happy to introduce you to Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this webcast today. I'm super excited because we have with us the author of Near Death Lessons, and his name is Chris Jankolowski, if I said that right. And I did do um, an intro prior to um, the beginning of this video, but I'm going to let Chris introduce himself and just talk a little bit about his journey, his book, and how he got here today. So Chris, take it away. Tell us about the beginnings of your journey. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you for having me here on the show. Um, you know, the the whole journey for me of the book started when I had a second brain operation and a tumor burst in my right hemisphere and, and I was having two tumors removed. And the doctor said, uh, after the operation, that 60% of people die on his operating table when that happens. So I was lucky to survive. But not only did he go, not only did, it, did the tumor burst and become a bloody affair, but then the right side, he went into the the left side, sorry, and took the left tumor out as well. Left me with eight months learning how to walk and talk. I had such, such incredible defects in my body that I was nursing, and I'd never experienced anything like that level of adversity. I thought I was going to die. As a matter of fact, the first two weeks when I got out of that operation, I thought I'm better off dead. There was, this was no way to live being that uh, damaged. It was not uh, humanly natural to be that damaged. Like I had two visions, not one. I, you know, When I turned my head, my vision would turn this way or when I look up, it would, it would turn up. I was spinning in bed. I couldn't walk, couldn't move. Everything on my left, including my face, no longer had neuro pathways. They were all severed since uh, since I'm born. They were just gone. And so that scary experience, you know, completely deaf and the list goes on, you know, tongue didn't work, blah, blah, blah. That experience, and when I got back home, I realized, wow, I had the operation one month before the birth of my second son, Billy. And, and here I am now. My wife is having to nurse me mm. and a newborn. And, uh, and I realized that the moment I can actually get out of bed and stand upright, because standing upright or sitting on a chair even takes energy. You can't get a dead person to sit on a chair. Mm. They don't have any core muscles or anything. They're going to just flop if they're floppy. Uh, well, Chris, uh, not, to, and, not to interrupt yeah, you, but sorry, tell, tell, tell yeah. us about VHL. What is it, VHL? Because From that's, that point? Yeah. yeah, tell us like... Because the when I read your show. book, the dis how you discovered that and your mental attitude towards it in the beginning and then how that changed. So just give our listeners a, qu a quick 
summary of what that is and how you oh, okay. found out. So, so, so at the age of 19, I, I mean, yeah, I got diagnosed with a rare hereditary condition because I had tumors in my eye and we, the doctors and me wanted to know why do I get at the age of 16 tumors in my eye. It took us three years to identify that I have a rare hereditary condition uh, through uh, new genetic testing back done early in the 90s. And when I went to a specialist to to find out uh, the, the the reasons for my my tumors in my eye, uh, because it was affecting my vision, I lost twenty five percent of my right vision. The doctor pretty much said, "Chris, we've discovered the reason for your tumors. You you have this thing called von Hippel-Lindahl syndrome. It means you're going to have cysts and tumors in all your major organs, and you may have them right now. Some are cancerous. You may even have cancer right now. Um, the average life expectancy is thirty. Uh, and you so say you're probably not going to have a long life. Um, it's a it's a new condition. We don't know much about it. Um, I want to wish you all the very best. I wasn't given any information. I wasn't given any support. I wasn't told what to do next. That was it. And um, I just went to my car, cried for a couple of weeks because you know I spoke to my parents, couldn't relate to them. I spoke to friends, no one could relate to this death sentence that I just received at the age of 19. And so what do you do at the age of 19 when you've been diagnosed and you're being told you're dead, you're going to be most likely dead by 30? Like any other 19-year-old person, I simply just ignored it. I didn't have any idea on how to deal with this. And so it was too overwhelming. And so I just ignored it. And I thought if I really truly ignored it deep down, I really pretended like I'd never got this diagnosis. I didn't do anything after when I did get told, like, you know, I should get MRI scans every year. I should get certain blood tests every year. Well, I did get eventually told that, which I still, by that point, I didn't do any of it because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using the strategy of ignoring, running away from life's problems. And uh, when I did that, I, um, I didn't know this at the time, but I pretty much lived a disempowered victim life for 13 years until the first brain tumor came and finally woke me up to the reality. No, I've got this. Yes, it's almost killed me. But that was a fascinating moment because after 13 years of feeling like I've got no control in my life, starting things, always stopping things, always feeling doubtful and insecure about everything I do, because what's the point? I'm dead by 30. You know, it made you question everything in our society's way. It made, there was no... There was no status quo for me anymore because I'm dead by 30. Was the, I had to reevaluate career in a very different way. I had to reevaluate everything. And so when that first tumor came, I was grateful that it was a relief. Like, okay, yes, I really do have this. Okay, I'm done. God, kill me if you want, but I'm not living like that anymore. I've had enough of living like that. There's no way. I'll, I'd rather, I don't know if I'm going to be in a wheelchair if I'm able to move or talk, whatever, and I'm going to be dead in a year or two later after this brain operation, but I don't care. I'd rather choose life. I'd rather choose to be in control of my life, to focus on life, than to always be running away from life. I don't want to live like that. And so that was an incredible moment. Oh, it sure sounds. It sounds very familiar to the stages of like grief that you go through when you lose a loved one. You know, like you you had denial and then years later you had acceptance of it. And I guess, you know, you kind of move through different stages. So I want to just talk to you about NDEs, near-death experiences, because you did sure. mention that in your book. And a lot of our listeners are fascinated with that topic and they just want to learn more. If you could go over like how many times you've experienced them, what were they like each time, how they changed you. You know, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, I mean, so there are there are a total of eight near-death experiences. Four uh, were transformative. Four were not transformative. Um, so I'll run through a catalog first of all of them very briefly. Um, at 70 years old, an appendix burst, almost killing me. Uh, in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, that was at the age of seven. And then at the age of 21, I almost drowned uh, by getting pulled out by a rip and uh, I full on inhaled water. And with that uh, with that experience, I had, uh, so at the age of seven, that first one, I had a vivid dream. I, I still remember to this day. I mean, who the hell remembers dreams from 
you know, 33 years ago or 43 years ago. Anyway, and the um, second one was the, the drowning, as I mentioned, which was uh, inhaling a lot of water and coming to a state of peace. I remember just how peaceful drowning really is. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember how my life at the age of 21 flashed before me typical that you hear from other people who've had so many of these similar experiences. You know, you see your life flash before you. I didn't see my possessions or things. I saw my family, my friends, important moments, almost like a photo catalog all the way down to when I was a baby. And then I, then I, then I somehow got out of it. Um, at 25, I had a, a, a eye operation where they, I woke up in the biggest nightmare. I woke up in the surgery and I felt the needle in the eye kind of move over my eyeball and I'd poke in and, and I'm clamped. I can't talk and hear the radio. Ah! <laughs> and they must have overdosed me because when I woke up, I uh, flatlined and um, I had the thing on my finger. I remember looking at it going like as it came off or, or there's the, mach- the machine stopped working or something. So that was a fascinating thing. Everything went white. And, and, and that was the time when I first recognized that, hang on a minute, I'm in a different time dimension. Hang on a minute, I've transitioned outside of my body right now. What's going on here? How come I'm still present? Why am I still conscious? In this, in that scenario, it all went white. And uh, then I was like, hey, I'm not going anywhere. It's my sister's wedding in the next week or two. Uh, and then I just snapped uh, back into life and they were about to zap me. So lucky that didn't happen. Um, and then at 32 was the brain, uh, that, uh, the brain, the brain tumor from VHL, a massive, a uh, five centimeter tumor that was ready to burst. It was causing electrical shocking pathways down my spine every time I would go to the toilet. And it was, I really pushed it. I mean, if we didn't, if I didn't go to the doctors to just randomly find out why am I getting a headache for two weeks, it would have got me. It would have killed me. I mean, I was literally, you know, when the doctors tell you, like, you know, Chris, you need to, you know, you get, you got to get operated. Um, like, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> that That first operation was, more like, wow, you've let this loose. You could be dead anytime. You, if somebody hits you in a bad way or if you have uh, even, you know, constipation or whatever it is, you, you know, you've let this so go that you, today's Tuesday, I'm booking you in the first uh, appointment I can get you and that's next week on Thursday. And so that was really a rush thing. That was the moment that woke me up that I mentioned. And then two months later, uh, I, I count this as a near-death experience uh, because both my, can- my both my kidneys were riddled with cancers, and my right kidney was removed. The cancers are large, four or five centimeters, aggressive. My father died from kidney cancer, and somehow, by the removal of my right kidney, and still nursing lots of tumors in my left, I didn't have a cancer battle. It didn't spread. So I, I said that was a near-death experience again, two months later. And then here I am again, uh, um, two years later, as I said, I'm going to take oh, a year or two later, I took uh, the other four tumors on my left kidney out um, and I didn't find uh, a kidney cancer battle. So that was another one. And that was the first one when I bargained for my life and uh, when I made a pledge to trade like more time on this earth for something noble in return. And that's when I did. You give me an extra 10 years of life in my kidney and I'll employ thousands of people. I felt like I needed to trade my my worth for being here. And uh, so that was the first. And then what's ironic is that uh, I had the, 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 the seventh was my brain operation the second time, which the tumor burst had left me for those disabilities. And then the eighth. And, 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 and wait, but the but the seventh was the most fascinating one because I was in a coma for five days and I was in another time dimension again. And when I was in the other time dimension, this was very different now because now it's not white, it's all black. I have vivid presence compared to before. I have just conscious presence. But this is now vivid. I'm alive in this space, but I don't have any hand, body sensation, no, 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 no temperature, no, no, no. So no, you no. were just like consciousness then? Conscious in this black void. And I'm having a conversation, which I don't know what that was, with somebody on my left about returning back to my body. Mm-hmm. And my father was above me 
who just passed four months ago, he was there in his presence. I could feel his presence there, panicking to, to have me make a decision or pleading with someone to get me back. And that was an incredible moment. That was the moment that really changed me again. But that wasn't um, the bargaining one. The bargaining one was that was before that. The bargaining one was the before that. Right. And then a year after that brain operation, I'm in the pool rehabilitating, still learning how to walk a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just off a walking stick and all this stuff. And um, being in bed for three months because of that operation left me with um, – it's very toxic for my body to not – to be in bed. It's very dangerous for anyone to be in no motion. Mm. So being in bed for three months – pretty much chewing me up. And I grew out of nowhere six kidney, uh, six kidney cancers again in my remaining life, last 75% kidney. And that was after me learning how to walk and talk and all this. I mean, here I'm back on my feet. I I, I really just felt like, oh, my God, I just survived this. It's amazing. Um, and then the book uh, happened, which I'll share in a second. But as you guys, as I mentioned, like, you know, I, I started writing the book after my brain operation when I got home, uh, probably three, like when I could sit on a chair. Uh, but the um, when I had the kidney operation, that too was a most incredible transformative moment because having gone through what I've just gone through, walking and talking, all these adversities, then uh, back and then kidney six cancer battles and not knowing if I'm going to be on dialysis, not knowing if I'm going to have a kidney cancer battle and be dead anyway in a year or two after going through this incredible the, the adversity. I remember this moment in the pool where I had this one outlook of life, which was the doctors telling me all this stuff, this gleam, this dark, gloomy outlook no, on dialysis. We don't know if your kidney is going to work after the operation. You, you might be having a cancer battle. This is really aggressive, Chris, compared to all the other growths. Your tumor grows normally hereditary by four millimeters a year, but yours just blew up. Um, that's We've never seen that before, blah, blah, blah. And then something happened. For three weeks before the operation, I was listening to a song and just praying and bargaining for my life and thinking, well, how am I, what's going to happen? And then that's when the most transformative moment happened in my life, when I realized that I don't have to accept that future. Nobody knows the future. Nobody knows what the outcome is going to be. We all anticipate, we all want, we all look forward to certain things, but no one actually ever in this world knows what the what tomorrow is going to be like, genuinely. Like we could all so, – so I had to realize right there for the first time that that is someone's prediction, anticipation, scenario, estimate, guesswork, scientific odds that they're giving me. But it's my choice, what I accept in terms of a future. And if I dare hope that the best is yet to come and put my energy into that, then that brings light. That that seems to have far more energy in the right direction versus this negative, heavy, dark energy of doom and gloom. And that was the moment that took me three weeks to shift, to dare hope in the worst adversity of my life to dare hope that the best is yet to come in my life now wow. I, I also was so moved by the strength you got from your wife that you wouldn't even mm -hmm. stay in a rehab or a hospital without as she was pregnant sleeping on the floor at one yeah. point so talk to us a little bit about that my wife is a super super woman she's amazing and um, small little asian woman <laughs> who I uh, always tease, um, but I love it to death. And uh, with she, she's uh, look. You can't go through these scary moments without. You need somebody there with you, and so she knows what I was going through. It was incredible, and she was more worried for me. And but for me, having her there, I mean, I there was I was on an edge of completely losing, as in. If I was able to get to the window, I would have jumped. There's no way I wanted to continue living. She was there and she helped me get through this incredibly dark moment. And I didn't want to stay at the rehab center because I because it's not a healing environment compared to being 
with my family at home, with my wife and the support that we can get. So for, for me, my wife, and still today, like right now, I am living in between LA and Sydney. And so I don't like being away from my family again. I, I get such strength when I'm with them. I'm so to, so um, at my balanced core. Mm. Well, when I don't have my family with me, it's all rev, you know, drive, energy. But when they're here, it's a, it's an incredible perspective because at the end of the day, we all pass. We all here. We all go. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, the biggest people we need to make a difference to is our own lives, followed by our family's lives. And only when we could do that properly could we take care of the the world's problems out there. Mm-hmm. Other people, our, our own. We all have interests. We all have things in which way we want to make our lives matter and count in some way. And and that can only happen when we make a significant impact into other people's lives. Mm. But you can't do that until you can sort your own self out, sort your family out, and then you can look after others. Right. So, so true. So for, for me, um, having my wife there always puts in perspective that I need to look after myself first. I need to look after them. And then I can look after others. It was when I bugged for my life the second time, I, I pleaded to say, since I wrote the book for, for my two young sons and the story looks so damn promising, uh, I really want to perhaps, you know what, Doc, yeah, you give me another, because let me go back to the, sorry, I'm dropping around everywhere, but um, okay. <laughs> on the kidney operation, when we had that kidney operation, five days after the kidney operation, I was supposed to receive uh, 90% of my healing in the first eight days. But I'm on day five, and my creatinine level, the measurement of the kidney function, was really bad. It wasn't far off dialysis. It was really high. The higher the number, the worse the kidney result. A dead kidney is at 600. I was like at close to 500 by day five. I sh- the doctor was hoping I'd be at 350 creatinine. And uh, then I spoke to the doctor. I said, listen, doctor, this is something where miracles happen. I said, doc, um, I know this isn't looking too good. You know, my ankle is all swollen up. I'm still freezing. My temperature sensation is all, all out of whack. It's amazing how much the kidney does for our body. Mm. And, uh, when you've got a kidney that's not working and it's your, and, you're, and you're on a half kidney now, you really, you know, you, anyway. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was really bad. And I'm in the ICU ward. And, um, and here I am and, and we're talking and, and the doctor's like, Chris, you know, it doesn't look good. Uh, you know, I don't know where you're going to land, but the way it's going, you're probably going to get another two years of kidney. Uh, I go, no, nah, doc. Oh, what, you mean I'm going to be on the house? He goes, yeah. No, no, I can't have that. He goes, what? I said, then what's the best scientific result you think? Because you're, he's a mathematician as well. What's the best scientific mathematician result you think I can achieve? He said, I think you can achieve 300 creatinine. At the at the you know you have the spectrum of the worst scenario right now, but the best scenario, the five percent best scenario for you, I think three hundred creatinine. And I said to him, "Okay, Doc, you focus on 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 science. I'll focus on miracle. How's two hundred? How 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 much kidney life will I have with two hundred creatinine?" He goes, "Well, to get two hundred, that would be an a, an amazing, fantastic result. You'll probably get seven years, and if you look after yourself." You can probably stretch it to 10. I go, done. I'll inspire millions, Doc. Let's let's shake on it. Uh, I want 10 years. And so when I'm bargaining with my life, he's just there as a as a witness, but I'm really bargaining to God. Right. <laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, so I did that, I shook shook hands on it. My wife was there, some other nurses were there, but this shift happened in me immediately. Like I felt uh, something, and I had this whole jubilance. I had this whole. I all of a sudden had no more worry. I all of a sudden had no more doubts about my welfare, and my health. I knew right then and there everything's going to be okay, because I said to myself, "Wow, if I've delivered on the first pledge when I had no employees and I've employed eight thousand people since, now I'm going to deliver on this pledge and die trying, because I know that's." A perp- now a new purpose that's keeping me alive. Didn't your level go below 200? You want to know where I am right now? Yeah. 
I'm at 115. Yeah, that's crazy. I, you, you mentioned that in the book, didn't you? No, no, I mentioned I, the I book. I could have sworn you went under yeah. 200. Yeah, I did. I did. The book I said I went to 125. Right, right. Or, uh, but I'm even better now. So, so two, a person with two kidneys is 100 creatinine. So that's amazing. Wow, 80, that 80 to 100. So I'm only on a half a kidney. I'm only a fraction off. Mm. Obviously, it's fragile. Like if I don't drink enough water, uh, it goes up to 145. Uh, or, you know, if I eat bad food, so I've got to look after them. You know, it requires work. It's not automatic. Yeah. Well, that's fine. It's worth the the trade-off, right? <laughs> exactly. And this is why I'm delivering. So I think it's very important. This work is very important to me because, and inspiring is very important because to inspire means you're helping somebody see beyond their limits. Mm -hmm. To inspire, you're helping somebody be motivated by their desires, not their fears. To inspire, you want to expand the possibilities in somebody and get them to believe in themselves again. So all these elements are so important because, you know what, if I'm a steward of this time right now that we all have here, we all are stewards of this time. It's not forever. We've got this time. And especially for me, I'm gone. Oh, no, I'm back. I'm back with my kids. I'm back here on this earth. You know how hard it is to be back in this physical, biological form? You know, if you're dead, there's no way you can return back to your physical form. Nobody knows how to return back to the physical form. I'm just mentioning that that is cosmically extremely difficult to do. But when you go to the other side of the cosmic world and you can return in, the, in this biological form, you, you you just you see things very differently, and I see one of the things I see is that we all have this time here on Earth, and we all are capable and gifted in some way to make an impact in this world. Every one of us has a unbelievable, some are grand, some are little, whatever they are, that's still an impact. And every one of us, I feel like, have a calling to deliver on this impact, and it's extremely important. And my hope is that I can ignite this calling and actions in people to apply this calling, whatever it is, because we don't know what's it. No one knows the future. No one knows how things are written for us, how things are connected, the impacts we make. But we do know that we are here and we have all got this innate drive in us, a desire to make an impact. And so I now need to frame that in everyone and, and help them you know, apply themselves to do it. And I think in this modern day and age, this time of history that we're all in, we all have the opportunity to build incredible businesses and apply ourselves in our passions and and in, in ways that we want to serve and, and commit to our communities and the things that we are more interested to care about than others. There's so many ways that we could all contribute today, more than ever before. Do you think your near-death experiences um because you went through so many transformations but do you think that they impacted you the most like out of anything in your in your experience with your illness do you think your ndes changed you transformed you the most of course of course um silent uh, meditation transformed me and uh in india and uh the need of experiences uh transform me so the the four not all of them um the the first one woke me up to the real my mortality it woke me up to this realization that shit if i don't start living the life i want to live i may never get a chance to that was amazing to me that was like a wake-up call that i don't have all the time in the world that brought forward all my decisions that brought forward the realities of i need to start living the life I want to live and get out of this fantasy trap. That actually grounded me. That grounded me to where my feet are today and it allowed me to go from this uh, uh, broken bank, uh, always uh, broke, always limited, uh, you know, disempowered individual to being a self-empowered individual. That transformed me in that way. And when I transformed from the victim to self-empowerment in this life, from somebody who feels like he's got no control in his life to somebody who is in control of his life, that transition, what was fascinating was that I couldn't believe just how much I was limiting myself 
once you make this observation and conscious decision to leave, it's a decision that we can only make. No one can make it for us. We need to make the decision to say, I choose to live a, a self-empowered life. And what does that mean? That means to believe, not doubt in you, in a nutshell. And so when I, and, and to take responsibility for your life. You see, there are only two things we're responsible in our life. Our thoughts, our actions. Everything else are excuses. So, so when, I, when I started to um, uh, make this transition, and I just couldn't believe how much I was counting myself short, limiting myself before I even begun anything. Shocking. And so I ran a race three weeks after my brain operations. I couldn't turn my head. <laughs> and I was peeing out blood because my kidneys are both riddled in cancer and um, not working properly and all this stuff. Um, and I run. No training. No preparation. I just, yeah. I mean, I had, I had an apartment at Bondo Beach in Australia overlooking the ocean, and I could see the preparation of the run. I wanted to run. You know, I got this new zeal of life. I got this whole new energy. And so I ran this race, and I couldn't believe the spring of my step. And then towards the finish line, I could see the clock that it said 58 minutes and 22 seconds when I finished. And I was like, Wow. Two years earlier, I, I ran this race. I trained for three months. I finished it in 65 minutes. How in the world, when I can't turn my head, I just had a brain operation. I've got all the reasons and excuses in the world. How in the world did I just run this at 58 minutes and 22 seconds? There's no explanation for it. And that's the, that's the moment that sealed it for me about how much am I truly limiting myself. So... I, I, I wanted to become a multimillionaire. I wanted to become a businessman. I had all these fancy dreams at, uh, that, I, that I made, at, at, like solidly, burnt my bridges at 25, but was failing miserably. But then after that brain operation, I took a year off. And then a year after coming back from that year off, I become a multimillionaire. I start touching anything I do, it becomes gold. <laughs> it's like, wow, it's so frustrating, this, this hairline of like abundance, poverty, abundance, poverty. It's a hairline. Yeah. But weren't mediocrity. you always driven? Weren't you no. always driven, even as a, a young child? Like you, you had yeah, a good sense of earning money, even as a young child. True. Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I, I had the ability to sell. I had the ability to earn. And uh, as my 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 mum would often say, you, yeah, Chris, you always have a knack for making money. Um, I, I learned early on in my life uh, leverage through um, hiring people and getting people to work for me and uh, uh, compounding the earnings of that kind of effort. Uh, so I've always been, a, as a businessman, I'm more of a creator and a person that knows how to um, uh, uh, assemble people, leverage uh, uh, the use of uh, using uh, talent to gain new levels of productivity those kind of things. Well, so, you knew that intuitively about yourself, but how, how yes. like, what would you recommend for someone who can't find that niche to be able to say, you know, I'm driven, but I just don't know what direction to go in. That's the biggest thing. So the biggest thing that I noticed when I, when I, when I point to that example that I said, like, you know, it's a hairline thing. Mm -hmm. That hairline is called um, doubts. Mm -hmm. See, your doubts, and you see, okay, let me, let me put a frame here, a, mm -hmm. a frame of structure of thinking. First, after my brain operation, when I woke up uh, and I'm in bed, I was awake from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. So that was the first time in my life I realized that, for some reason I didn't realize it before then, was that just how limiting our energy is. You know, first, everyone has to wake up to this reality that we do not have, have all the energy in the world all day. You know, we need to sleep. We don't have the ability to focus for 14 hours straight. We don't have the ability to apply ourselves every second of the day. So wake up to this reality. Your energy is limited. Two, wake up to another reality. You ain't going to get after whatever you're trying to go after. If you ain't all in, if you ain't putting everything towards this and making it your best step and trying to grow and learn and apply yourself over an extended period of time. So you cannot go all in when you're in doubts and insecurities and uncertain about why you want to do something. 
Because when you're uncertain, you're going to get pulled and swayed in all different things. You're going to run around, chase your tail. You're going to follow a pattern every three to five years that gets you back in the same place over and over. You're going to find out that like when you're nearly 50, you're going to be like, why haven't I made progress in my life? It's because you've never sat down to really truly get real with yourself about what is it that you want out of life? Because you've got to look at that mirror and wake up to your mortality. You ain't going to live forever. Mm. You have to bring it forward. You've got this moment. What is it? Now, this is the way I go about it. Uh, I... I, 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 I look at images first because I, I'm very visual and I think all of us are very visual. Our consciousness, please, everyone, our consciousness, we all know this is limited, okay? So do not count on your consciousness to find out your desires. Your consciousness is what mess up your desires and your ability to understand your desires. You've got to use your subconscious to draw out deep in you what is it that you bloody want out of your life. And the way I go about doing that, because I don't know either, well, how do I go about it? Well, first, I know one, two things. Our subconscious mind, we can communicate to it and it can communicate back to us through feelings and gut instincts is through image, images, visual, visual things. Okay, not words, visual. And the other one is uh, our values, our goals, whatever they are. That's another way that our subconscious knows, oh, this is important for you. So therefore, I need to keep your brain patterns alive. Or therefore, I need to put more energy towards this. Or therefore, let's use the brain more to bring what we've observed to his awareness. So knowing this, find images that will put a smile on your face. You might not understand why something makes you happy or why. Sometimes the image of a goal, like a jet or whatever, represents something or a house or whatever it is. It represents. Then get clear what it represents. That's the goal. Hmm. Then you must lay, list down all the reasons you can think about why this is important for you to have in your life and and how that makes you feel. you got to write it. I go for a simple process. I write it one out of ten, and then I, you know, I list the negatives also. And, and pros and cons. And then I don't look at the execution. I don't look at like the realities of can, can I pull it off or whatever. None of that matters. What matters to me most is, is this something I want in my life? Am I clear as to why it's important in my life? And then I do something else. I schedule it. I am only responsible for my actions, my thoughts, how I apply myself, okay? I'm going to apply myself as, to my best capacity. Yeah. You know, when people know better, they do better. I've heard that somewhere. That's an incredible statement. But the only way we are going to know if we could do better is if when we apply ourselves, the, when you apply yourself, you make mistakes. You grow. Because we all have a plan, and that plan's always, oh, here's the goal. Do this, and here's the outcome. It's never linear. It's never been linear. You're going to stuff it up. It's going to go up, down, sideways. But when you know it's important for you, you're going to be at it. You're going to stick at it. And what's fascinating is why do you need to stick at it? Because sticking at it means you now are discerning and learning and growing capabilities, skills towards something that's important. And you're always underestimating what you can do when you're much more capable in the future. Yeah, that's so true. Now, you you also mentioned how to not take things personally. And I think that a lot of people struggle with that because it is personal when it happens. So how do you distance yourself, especially when it comes to business? Because you've had mm -hmm. successful business and you've had unsuccessful business. So how did you learn to not take things personally? Well, first, you got to re re the biggest thing, like right now, um, you know, I still experience it. Like I still experience things not taking off and not working and trying hard and spending all this money. It's still happening. As, as, as I mentioned in my book, The Paradox of Su Success and Failure. So uh, applying yourself and getting more and more skilled and, and more and more wealthier and more and more capable in your life doesn't guarantee success either. Mm -hmm. They're just results. So results.
they're just feedback. They're, they're, they're inputs. So I distance myself from results because I know deep in me that I'm doing my best. I can look in the mirror and go, you know what? I'm doing, I'm giving, I've given it my all. And when I apply myself fully and I fail fully or succeed fully, um, I don't judge myself hard. Who am I to judge myself and who am I to judge others? I just got to recognize and put things in perspective that, hey, uh, when you take things personally, what I've noticed, I have to backtrack here for a second, is when I take things personally, it takes me years to bounce back from a setback. When I don't take it personally, I move on very fast. So it's very important to not take things personally because when you take things personally, you are not receiving the feedback. Therefore, you're not growing, you're not learning. Like when my first editor reviewed my book and shot it down, I almost thought I was going to sue her. <laughs> I was so upset and emotional for the first three days. I couldn't see her advice for what it was. And then when I, the emotions cooled off and I finally picked up the information again and read her recommendation, I was blown away. Six pages of incredible advice. I spent nine months applying everything. And that was the first time I actually woke up to the reality of, oh, my God, how cloudy do, does our thinking get when we take things personally? Yes. We can't even see the, the solutions and advice that are gold in front of us. Therefore, we're not learning. We're not growing. So taking personally affects all the – when you take things personally, it affects your ability to grow, affects your ability to learn, affects your ability to move on. You're losing opportunity time because when I lost my, my money, almost all of it for the first time, I lost two years of life where I could have been creating and moving on and earning. Instead, I was retracting from life. Do not run away from life's problems. When you run away from life's problems, you are – whether you believe it or not, whether you recognize it or not, you are being a victim of something. Right. You're, you're, you are choosing to be a victim. When you confront life, that means you're saying that I'm going to take on my life problems. I'm going to take on my dreams. And I'm going to do something about it. Now you're an empowered individual because you believe in yourself to apply yourself. Running away from problems doesn't solve problems. It disempowers us. What made you have the drive to travel so much and you put yourself in some dangerous situations? Travel is fascinating. I love traveling because, um, you know, brain patterns, that's what we are. All of us have got brain patterns. And the brain, as I said, is limited energy and it want, it's lazy. It wants to just fire synapses and do it in a way that's economical and efficient for the body. It doesn't want to, you know, when I move the little pencil lid, from the left side to the right side, it knocked me out for an hour for the first time and my hand didn't move and I uh, got control for the first time. Why? And when my occupational therapist said, Chris, that's that's your, that's your just a, a new synapsis connection. It's like forming a new paradigm. That's how much energy it takes for the brain to form a new pathway because your brain has to use energy to go all these back roads, all your highways of repeated use has been broken. And therefore, now... I'm saying this story right here to explain travel because when we set in our ways, set in our ways, it means we've settled in our home in a one location, in one environment, and therefore we are prone because our brain is lazy, wants to just keep firing whatever patterns and thoughts and emotions and feelings you feel. It gets them deeper, deeper, deeper. That is quite you, the problem with settling and uh, and allowing for your brain patterns to get stronger in that is that you then perceive the world from this reality that you've formed. It's a perception. You've just perceived a reality and it's hardwired. You know, you, you're hardwired in thinking that life is like this, that you are like this. Mm. Bullshit. You are not that way. You can be who you want to be. You can change. I can't believe that we can really change, but we can. Mm. And, and you, the way you're perceiving the world isn't necessarily the, true, the truth of it all. Isn't necessarily the reality of it all. It's just what you're perceiving that way, that world to be that way. It's just a perception. And so when you travel, you wake up. It takes about three months normally. 
you wake up to uh, this transition and mm-hmm. then you see, oh, wow, like, you know, look at how other people, what they, what makes them happy or what they regard as beautiful or what they have aspirations for, what, what the quality of life. I mean, look at America, how hard we all work here versus when you, when you go to Europe and you go, what the hell are these guys having a three-hour lunch? Why do they value this lifestyle, this what the hell are they doing in Greece having this dinner and a fiesta at 10 at night every friggin' eat every day? What, why are people, people, so people live, and then when you go to India, it's a whole nother thing again. When you go to Asia, it's a whole nother thing again. So everywhere I go, it's just, it's fascinating. And culture is, I, I enjoy learning because I have a fascination in people. I have a fascination in how we all live our lives, how we all value things differently around the world. How we all have different different aspirations, but what I love about America is I love this liberty. I love you see in Australia, uh, and, and Australia is a remarkable part of the world. It doesn't get crazy. Like let's say there's a zero to a ten ratio, mm-hmm. and zero is like crazy, like you know, you're, you're crazy, dangerous, bad society. Ten is like incredible society, amazing people. Incredible beauty everywhere. Uh, Australia is four to ten. It doesn't get crazy. Four to ten. It's amazing. It goes to ten. But America does something else. And, uh, and, and, and other parts of the world have these other ratios within zero to ten. But America goes negative three, positive 15. Mm. It doesn't play by the normal rules. It, the, the liberty values allows for free expression, allows for people to, to I don't know, there's something here where, where those that do become self-empowered, those who choose to apply themselves to get clear with their desires, that they burn their bridges, that's, that's it, that's what they're going to do. I am going to inspire millions, dying, trying. I will, therefore, I'm going to do it or die trying. So my reality, my existence is I'm going to get it done. I'm not going to stop. So what? The of the it. So, so, right. so you see that energy? Yeah. You will die. I'm all in. Right. What, what's happening here? I've been a pledge. I'm focused on long term. I'm focused on taking, doing my best. I'm committed to evolving and growing and becoming better. The problem is a lot of people – don't go all in. So when we're all out there in competition with each other to create certain dreams and create certain businesses, first thing, know that we're not in competition. It's just with ourselves. It's not with other people. Now, when you're out there, you are more powerful when you're all in on something versus being half-hearted about it. If I'm all in on something and you're up against me, you're dead. Or up against somebody else who's all in, you're dead. And then as you get more sophisticated in life and more wealthier, if your team is disempowered versus my team that's empowered, you're dead. The logic still applies. So what? how do you think you can inspire people the most? Is it the power of your story? Or mm. do you plan on using like a strategic plan or itinerary or go give speeches all over the globe? Like, where do you see yourself going with this? This is a whole organic work, yeah? I mean, you got to remember, none of this was by intention. So I wrote a book initially for my two young sons to know who their father was. Then a year later, I'm bargaining for my life, and I decided to make the story public. And then as a result of making the story public, I spent six years writing this book because I didn't want to just share my story anymore. I wanted to share these distinctions and life lessons that I shared, the five life lessons. And... um so a lot of effort went into that. Now the book has gone live and, and, and it is a, a story that helps wake up people with their mortality, helps mm-hmm. wake up people to believe in themselves and, and their own lives and their dreams. And obviously that's just one way to go about it. So I'm now evolving into, so I've just created uh, my uh, personal brand on the christianklovsky.com website. I will be, uh, rebranding the book and relaunching the book again and then applying myself in a different way, uh, doing more and more media appearances, eventually putting myself out there and speaking. People need to feel my energy and my authenticity. It's the only time they're going to really 
be uh, woken up to something. Right. And uh, that that's it, the work's going to evolve. I don't, it's not a plan that I'm following. It's really uh, stages. How do I get past a thousand book sales? How do I get past ten thousand? How do I get past them? You know, you can't get to a million, inspiring million, without inspiring one. You can't inspire the next person without inspiring the next person. It's all one at a time, one at a time. And then how do you amplify the effectiveness of doing one at a time? So it's it's building a system. When did you get that calling to use your story and your experiences? Like, when did that happen for you? In the ICU ward, bargaining for my life at the second kidney operation. So then the age of 44. Shocking, isn't it? It is. I, I, I got a miracle healing. I mean, most of my, I got like five people trying to keep me alive and two different uh, hospitals from different, two different parts of the world. There's a lot of people behind me. <laughs> uh, like I write all these things and a lot of people don't understand that this is what his story has been like. How is he now? Well, I'm still fighting for my life. I haven't stopped. I still live with uncertainty. I've still got six brain tumors right now. I've still got three cancers growing in my remaining half kidney. I've still got battles. Oh, yeah. And they're out of my control. I'm focusing on what I can control. I'm focusing on life. If I'm, if I'm going to not work out or look after myself, drink enough water or eat rubbish, whatever, and then die because of diabetes and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you know, what the hell? Uh, so these things are God's business and genetics and whatever. I'll just focus on whatever I'm doing. So none of these things that are outside of my control, I worry about. It takes energy. When you worry about something, it takes energy. So why worry? You have limited energy. Do not waste your energy on the past that you cannot longer change or do anything about. And do not waste your energy on things outside of your control. Focus on what you can control. And I mentioned that already. Your thoughts, your action. Leave it at that. So get clear with your desires. You ain't going to be here forever. What What's fascinating, every time I go and I come back, I come back and I realize that all that matters, it's like onion layer feeling. It's like I, I keep going through this reset button, reevaluate everything, question all assumptions and belief, evaluate your the perceptions of everything. And, and um, it's like onion layer keeps removing, removing, removing. And every time I go to my core, to, for me it is, anyway, I don't know about others, but for me, it is, you're here, make your life count. You're here, serve, help as many people that are here while you're here. That That's a message that's always come through me loud and clear. That's such a beautiful message. Uh, it, it's like your energy is, is just so genuine too. Like even mm. in reading the book, I I could feel your energy. It was oh, awesome. incredible. It was incredible. So what's what's for you next, Chris? What's happening right now that's exciting you that you could share with us? Well, I, I'm so the first six months I spent all this energy and time trying to get the book off the ground. And so now I'm about to relaunch the book with this whole new vibrant color that represents my energy, represents my story much more, and uh, a new subtitle and all this stuff. Show us um, the book. Show us the book. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Uh, I'm, I'm excited because, you know, this is um, um, very uh, extensive work and uh, it's a very important work. Because my, Why is it important? Because it's life and death for me. I need to live up to this or die trying. So it better be a bloody be- good effort, right? I can't <laughs> stop. So That's this is now beautiful. the beautiful. It really is. It's very reflective of your personality. Uh, it's incredible when you can work with the with the right type of uh, people and uh, not stop trying. You see, when you don't stop trying, you evolve, you improve. You know, I tried with the book. I launched. But the current book that I have, the cover's too dark. But my story is not dark. Yes, there are bits that are dark. Yes, it's incredible how many setbacks I have. But it's not a dark story. I mean, did you think it's a dark story? No. Not at all. So that's why this book design doesn't reflect the story. To 
A dream, a terminal illness, an extraordinary life gained from eight near-death experiences. Okay, it's intriguing, but it's not captivating the essence of what the story is. Right. And so I wanted to capture the essence of what the story is and the new subtitle of A Journey of Healing Entrepreneurial Success and the Creation of an Impactful Life better represents the whole story. I agree. And then, and then the back cover talks more about me and uh, all the way. And so I'm the least important equation in this. I just happen to be the vessel of the story. I don't want to use my story, frankly speaking, because, you know, it's not about me. Mm. But the story is an incredible demonstration. My story is an incredible demonstration because I don't know anyone else who's had as many incredibly severe setbacks and bounces back over and over, decades apart, stronger. From a $4 million house, to a $16 million house, eight months later from a serious adversity, from one thing to another. Like, there's so many of these. And so, and then I had to change the back cover to put it in this new way, which says, what if uh, challenges are not mere random occurrences, but rather a part of a larger universal pattern or plan that eventually provides us with an opportunity to personally grow and transform even, like in my case, entrepreneurial, gain entrepreneurial success. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian Gwalke's extraordinary story and lessons gained from eight near-death experiences takes us on a roller coaster journey, because it is a roller coaster journey, of highs and lows and everything in between. And my book is also very emotional, isn't it? I mean, you go on an emotional journey. People tell me that they cry, they laugh. It's, it's a whole journey. Oh, and so, yeah. so, so gain a new perspective on what's most important in your life and how to respond to life's unpredictable challenges with self-empowered mindset is what I'm all about. Chris's story will make you feel optimistic and hopeful. It will make you feel like never giving up on yourself in your dreams. Mm -hmm. That's important. And to have Jack's endorsement is phenomenal because when, when I was part of a program and Jack had a chance to read my book, I just couldn't believe what he said. Somebody like Jack, who's like, I look up to and has sold half a, a million, uh, half a uh, half a billion books and all this mm -hmm. stuff. To say I love your story, I think the first half reads like like an Indiana Jones kind of a thing. I couldn't stop turning the pages. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive stuff. Well, what do you have for us in closing? Look, I have to just mention. And, and, and put the elephant back in the room, time. Time is a perception that we've all humans have made. Whatever it is, it's not as long as you all think. Stop living like you've got all the time in the world. Stop pretending like you're never going to die because the problem with that and, and having a fear of your mortality, the problem with fearing mortality is it doesn't wake you up to living life to the fullest. It doesn't wake you up to the realities of the magic of the time that we do have here. Stop running away from life's problems because that's not how to solve problems. I don't know anyone who's ran away from problems to solve them. When you run away from one problem, you're running away from a lot of other problems in your life and you don't even know it. You are choosing to be a victim of circumstances in your life when you do that. You do not need to be a victim. If you're living a life where you feel like there's circumstances outside of you that are controlling your life, Know that you're a victim. <laughs> That's the clue. To be a self-empowered individual is to believe in you. To eliminate your doubts through having clarity with your desires. It's really that simple. Understand your values. They don't change. I understood my values friggin' 25 years ago and they're still the same. <laughs> I mean, there's like uh, priority shifts, right. but they're pretty much the same. So when you, get, when you understand certain things, what am I referring to here? Learning, growing. Understand that you're full of brain power. Do not just feed this reality that your brain is giving you that because it's lazy, it doesn't want to change. You know, need, to have a new perception of reality, to expand your reality is to expand your knowledge and awareness. You cannot do that if you're always in the safe zone. Why are you being safe? You ain't getting out of here alive. That is so brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Chris. I'll be sure to share this far and wide. I think you have 
an amazing story behind you and in front of you. And we're so grateful that you're sharing it with us because it's it's definitely going to change lives. Uh, I hope so. That's my prayer. That's my commitment to life. So I'm here to deliver. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Hope to speak with you again soon. Sure. Love to. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.